Um, so I am Rachel Schley. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of History at Linfield College, and I'm with Ruby Guyot, class of 2019. And we are here in Beaverton, Oregon, um, with Hulda Fitzsimmons, who attended Linfield. Fitzsimmons, it's oh, one Fitzsimons. M. Fitzsimmons, excuse me. Holda, Everybody makes that mistake. Hulda Fitzsimmons, <laughs> yes. um, whom we're interviewing today, who attended Linfield from 1940 to 1941. And we are speaking with her in her home on April 19th, 2019, at 1.15 p.m. Um, so just to get things started, um, we thought maybe you'd tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background before getting to... Okay. It the was years. the Depression. Nobody had any money, absolutely. There were a few, maybe, but this is the farm I grew up on. My sister did that. Oh. And there were four of us girls. It was a fruit farm uh, in the Red Hills south of Salem. It was established by the, um, oh, which is a church? Newburgh. What's the school at Newburgh? What church is that? The Friends. Pardon? The Friends Church? Yeah, well, it was called the Friends, the yeah. They had a little church out there in my neighborhood that we attended quite a bit. And... Uh, Herbert Hoover platted all that land for his uncle, and uh, it was prunes and cherries mainly, mm. and we had strawberries. So there were four of us girls, and my oldest sister was 17, just graduated from high school, and a drunk ran into the back of our car and killed her outright. So. Mm. The rest of us survived. My dad was injured badly, but it destroyed our car, and they had all that expense, and they never got anything out of it. So it was right at the crash, 1929. So everything was, from then on, was downhill. We never. My parents had a dryer. They dried prunes. We picked girls picked cherries. We were really proud that we could put the tree ladders up because they were big high trees then. They didn't, they don't, didn't cut them like they do in Hood River. So they were about 18 foot ladders so we could get them up. You lay them down and I don't remember how we did, but we'd get them up. And we all worked on the farm, hoeing strawberries and picking. And so it was a hard life for my parents, but um, so then, when I graduated from high school, my sister, was, who was five years older, had gone to Willamette two years, and I don't think she had any money to go. My uncle in McMinnville su suggested to me, why don't you apply at Linfield and see if you can get a scholarship? So, um, wasn't that great a scholar, but they took, I think they were good to get any money they could. So I don't know where I came up with $50, but that was $50 for one semester, and it was, they let the other 50 go as a, you know, scholarship. So then we, where were we going to live? So there, uh, Linfield had one year, I think they only did one year, girls co-ops. A freshman girls co-op. You know where that little house is? You know when you come in from the east side of, I've forgotten the street, of uh, into the campus, that street there from the east. What is it called? There's a, used to be a an upper class dorm across the street. It was another co-op, I think. I can't remember that street. It might be College Avenue. The, because you mentioned that the pop shop was yeah. nearby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the bicycle co-op now, mm. where oh, that is right. on that side of campus. Well, that was pop shop, and so all the upperclassmen would hang out there and watch the new for the new freshman girls. <laughs> <laughs> so the first day I started out, uh, I was immediately latched on to it. I, I dated him for the first <laughs> most of the year. <laughs> but they just hovered there watching, see which girls they'd pick out. <laughs> it was kind of fun. 
We all wore wooden, not all of us, but we wore wooden shoes, and we'd be late for, for we all had to go to, um, what was it called, chapel. Every morning we had to go to chapel, and you'd hear those wooden shoes like, so like horses going. <laughs> Uh, so what what made you want to go to college in the first place after high school? Well, what else was there to do? But pick, <laughs> I mean, there was nothing else to do. There wasn't mm -hmm. any work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only people that were working maybe were middle-aged or young people uh, had no way to make money except my mm -hmm. husband, who I married. Um, delivered papers all the way through high school. I don't know how I went through high school because they'd be up at four o'clock every morning and deliver papers. And uh, and some of the fellows, a lot of them joined the National Guard because they got a little bit of money a month. So it was a way to make a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. If you were lucky, you could work in the cannery in the summer but it was mostly the older women who kept those jobs. And I worked in the counter a couple of times, but you know, we got 25 cents an hour. The fellas got 35 cents an hour. <laughs> but um, mainly my sister Helen wanted me to get away from home and have a new experience in life. So she worked at the glove factory. Mm -hmm and they let her live there. So she paid our, her and my rent by working at the glove factory. And then I needed a job because I couldn't work on campus because they'd already given me $50 off. So I went all over Mac trying to get a job. And I used to clerk and, you know, I could do that. And finally I got hired at the theater. And, uh, so I worked at two of the theaters. And that was kind of a little bit hard going to college to be there. You had to work till 11 o'clock, um, like some weeknights, I, one weeknight a month. I, I mean, one weeknight I might have to work and worked on the weekends sh ushering. So I had a cute little cute outfit, and I had a <laughs> flashlight, and I'd go see people and watch boring movies. <laughs> <laughs> what kinds of movies were they showing at Pardon? the time? What kinds of movies were they showing um, at the time? Right, I know Gone with the Wind had just oh, come out, wow. because my girlfriend's from, um, what do we call our house? Can't even think, oh, where we lived. Uh, we went, and my friend Eleanor, Ellie, cried so much, she, she had the sweater, she had tears all over her sweater. <laughs> I remember they just, probably all our sweaters kept shrinking. You know, they were all wool then, and you'd start out with a sweater that was reasonable, and by the end of the year, your sweater was really tight. <laughs> uh, so I think that attracted quite a bit of attention from the fellows. <laughs> but um, anyway, so we had to take turns cooking, and we had a big wood stove. So you know, wood stoves are horrible because it takes forever to get them heated up. And then we had in our, we all, um, Viola left. There were 10 of us originally, so that left nine of us upstairs in that house. And I think there may have been three bedrooms, I don't remember, and there was a sun porch. So some of us slept on the sun porch in sleeping bags. And um, of course we both all slept two to a bed and we had a wood stove in the middle of the living room. And a fellow that I knew from high school was going to Linfield. He'd come up and get the fire started in the morning. That was to heat our water for our one bathroom for nine girls. Our, our uh, house mother had her own bathroom downstairs, but we weren't, you know, we were never 
down there to use it. We were never invited. <laughs> <laughs> so we sometimes we'd have good meals, sometimes we'd have pretty horrible meals and um I think we were on our own for breakfast and lunch and uh one fellow was going there. He died just recently. His name was Jack Hundrup. Maybe you've heard of him. He uh loved to come and have stuff um, green peppers when we had them. <laughs> <laughs> he was the only one that liked them. <laughs> but anyway, oh, I can't think what else. What were your initial impressions when you first got to Linfield? I loved it because going to Salem High was so clickish and uh, I think maybe Willamette wasn't if you got away from high school. But there's only one one high school for the whole county plus that's all it was in Salem. It was a great big high school and uh, so it was a matter of competing all the time to ever get to do any take part in anything because there's such what were there 2,000 of us or something so it was really hard but going to Linfield was so friendly. Everybody said hi, you know, on the way to school, and it's really neat. I loved it. And uh, I took singing lessons and uh, tried out for the choir, but I didn't make it. But probably it was just as well because I was always tied up with that theater, you know. <laughs> And then, by then, I was going with the man I married, and uh, he was at, stationed at Fort Stevens. Well, he was at cab class up then. They had uh, signed up for the National Guard, and Roosevelt had them conscripted for a year. So they lived at Camp Clatsop, which is now Camp Rylea, in tents. They had heat and everything in the tents, but must have been really boring, you know. But he would come down and pick me up once in a while, take me to Salem, and we'd go down. And that's because he was from Salem and I was from Salem. We both went to the same church. We sang in choir together. That's probably why I broke up with the other one. <laughs> <laughs> my, my husband to be said, it's him, it's me or him. And so I chose him. Oh. <laughs> And the whole time you were at Linfield, your, hus your husband to be was um, at the at Fort Stevens. Well, it was Camp Riley at the Camp Riley Camp, at the time. Yeah, Camp Class it was called. Oh, okay. But then after the war broke out, they built all those uh, barracks at Fort Stevens, and they were stationed there. So he stayed there nearly the whole war, which I was glad for. Okay. Yeah, because it was such a worry. You know, anybody that had anybody in the war, especially the South Pacific, I lost a couple of good friends there, and um, one of them, his brother, never never got over it. It was such a horrible war with the Japanese. I think everybody dreaded that more than the Germans. But anyway, so. Did you talk about the war on campus while? No, we didn't really. Because it had yet to start in the Because it was really. it was the forties, and the war didn't break out till forty one. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I can still remember coming out of church that morning and hearing about it. And uh, Governor McKay's daughter went. They all went to our church, the Presbyterian Church in Salem, and they had gone to Hawaii for a football game. Well, Emma did, mm -hmm. and so they were stuck over there for a while. But they, uh, anyway, that was any kind of interesting. So people were more interested in talking, of course, about what was going on in the Pacific than what was happening with Germany. Well, no, everybody was in, just as interested, but mm -hmm. for some reason, I did um, Tarawa and all those places in the Pacific were such horrible battles. Mm -hmm. Of course, any battle is, but 
um, the Japanese had no respect for the Americans. They thought to surrender was, you know, such... They had no respect for Americans if they surrendered. They'd, they'd just be killed, you know. You know, remember the Bataan Death March? The Japanese were... Uh, paid no attention to the Geneva Convention. I wonder if um, you could talk about if you saw the war impact life on campus at all. Uh, there weren't any, well... Like, were there less men? Because There were, were still experience. fellows there. Mm -hmm. They were still there. I don't think very many of them volunteered. I mean, no, because 40, the war didn't start till 40, 41, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, so it didn't affect us then, except there were uh, people down at Camp White in near, near Corvallis, I believe. There were soldiers down that, there, and that's where my friend met her husband. He was in, in the cavalry. And uh, I think, I don't know, one night I had a, somebody asked me to go out with this fellow from probably Camp White because he was lonely and <laughs> after the dance then he went up and parked on a hill and I had to get out of that. So. <laughs> oh. Were the soldiers mostly in these camps or did they, were they on camp at all, uh, on campus at all recruiting or? No, I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. No, there wasn't any of that that year because it, it, it happened after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 41. Right, okay. That was December of 41. Right, yeah. Yeah. What kinds of classes were you enrolled in? During, Pardon? What kinds of classes were you enrolled in during your time at... Well, I know I took German, because that was my third year of German, and I took... Um, I think I took public speaking, but I don't remember, because I don't remember that teacher. But I took... Psychology, I really like psychology. And I took something else, uh, probably English, plus uh, singing classes. That counted. That was about all the time I had. Now I'm going to tell you about one experience. I wrote a book and put this in. Uh, because I was so busy trying to keep up and cook, and, you know, where did we girls wash our clothes? We, all we had was a wash tub. We did, and probably cold water. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't have showers. We lucked out when the campus closed down. If we were still there, we could go over and take sh showers at the other dorms. But they had a, um, a group there and there, the collegiate something or other, and there was the men and there were the girls. Mm -hmm. And we were always supposed to be able to come up with a school song or some other hooey <laughs> at when they were called upon. And I wasn't coming across, I never paid that much attention and I was too busy with other things. One night they came to the, to the co-op in the middle of the night I don't remember, curfew was 10, so probably it was about 8 o'clock. And they took me, two of them, to this room, and they had candles lit. It was a kangaroo court. And they questioned me about why I wasn't singing the school song and why I didn't know the school yell and all that stuff. I started crying. I just couldn't, t you know, it was just hideous. So I went, they took me back to the, our, our uh, co-op and I told my friends and everybody was just furious and I think they stopped it hmm. because it was just stupid. I didn't go to college to learn school songs and all that stuff. Would you, do you have to learn school songs now? No, we don't. I mean, <laughs> you were treated like some kind of an imbecile. You know, we had to wear that thing all year, this mm -hmm. pin or 
ribbon to show we were freshmen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after that, I think they sort of eased off. But it was so, so stupid. So there was a very different etiquette code on campus, it seemed like. Oh, my goodness. It, such a chase school. <laughs> <laughs> Ten o'clock curfew, no boys in the dorm unless they were in the waiting room. And uh, we didn't ever let him, we could lay boys at our, you know, they, we had no waiting room. And so if we went out on a date and came back and maybe you had a kiss good night on the front porch, the girls across the street and the upper class co-op would rat on us and tell the dean. <laughs> I would never get called in to be questioned by the dean. I was going with this fellow who was blonde and Helene Buker had blondish hair and uh, so they thought it was Helene that mistook her, the, the, him for her I think and she got called in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how my sister stood it. She was five years older, but she was so she was so good to me. Mm. Otherwise, I couldn't have done it. Mm. So anyway, I already told you about uh, the three that were involved actually with war, as far as I know. But. Um, Ellie, Ellie married Al Pache. He was in our class, and he went into Navy, and she and they stayed married for years. And Marge married the, the cavalry man, and I married Eric. He was um, decided after we'd gone together for two years, and that going together doesn't mean what it means today or dating doesn't mean what it does today. If you were even seen kissing a boy in, on campus, you were in trouble. <laughs> oh, oh. I had very great memories of Linfield. Everybody was so nice. Mm -hmm. Were there different ways? I know the war had only started in Europe. It obviously hadn't broken uh -huh. out um, in the Pacific yet. Um, and you had lots of friends, or it sounds like at least three friends, including yourself, who were dating people um, in the service. Um, were there different ways that you all talked about the military or what was going on far away in Europe or the way faculty or staff? I don't think it was on our mind that year. Mm. Mm. No, I think the United States didn't have it on their minds because there wasn't the draft yet. I mean, they weren't being drafted. Just the ones that were in the National Guard, you know, were in probably back east. I don't know what was going on the West Coast then, but it didn't pick up until later. And. Um, so, no, I know you're thinking about the war. I think the next year would be more, mm -hmm. more of an involvement there. So you only attended Linfield for one year. You left after 1941. Why did you choose to leave Linfield? I didn't have any more money. Mm. Where did we get money then? I would go, when I was a little kid, I'd, we, I'd go to the store with my dad and ask him for a penny to buy candy, and he'd come out with a washer or a cough drop. That would be, you know, never any money. It was just, you just can't believe how hard it was. We had, that was the era when we had so many people coming from the Dust Bowl, mm -hmm. and we had wonderful people who moved out here from the Dust Bowl, and uh, so many came to our church, and they all found some some way to make eke out a living, but um, it was just kind of hand to mouth all the time. So uh, it, things didn't get better. Actually, if it hadn't been for the war, I don't know what, what would have happened to this country, because so, 
all the jobs and all that. What a sacrifice, you know, for the people who died to get our country back on its feet again. You know, people, I don't think people think of that aspect. It's all about the glory of it, but it was um, so much grief. Mm -hmm. But anyway. What did you do when you ended up leaving Linfield in 1945? I went home and my sister got married and um, I don't know what, I went to business school and I at least learned to type and uh, couldn't stand shorthand. <laughs> <laughs> I just could not stand it. so. It's kind of like taking phys a physics class as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but anyway, um, let's see. Where did you go to business school? Oh, in Salem okay. Business College. And uh, it paid off learning to type because um, my, my boyfriend and I decided he had this don't quote me, please. He had this, after two years of going together, he said, it looks like I'm not going to get out of the army, so we might as well get married. <laughs> <laughs> so don't quote that. But anyway. Um, it's practical. <laughs> yeah, right. But anyway, um, I had to have a job, because he only got like, had like $20 a month at all. At the most, I don't remember. He was in the, they were army then, permanently, after Pearl Harbor was bombed. Uh, and so, he, um, my mother heard about the fact that um, the Social Security was starting and they needed key punch operators. And so I, tried out and since I'd typed I could key punch so I got a job so I made a, a what was it did I get a hundred a month or two hundred I don't remember but anyway I had a job so that was so I lived it with my parents because and uh, even after we got married because Eric would only get out like once every two months for a weekend pass or something but another interesting item in my life is the weekend we got married at Fort Stevens in the chapel. Uh, he had a 24-hour pass. That was all. So we got married on the uh, got married, and as soon as we left the chapel, it was the pass started. So we had a sit-down luncheon in Seaside, and then we went. To Manzanita for overnight. That was it. That was it. So he get, went back. He had to be back at the fort the next day. So I said goodbye to him because he was supposed to get out the next night. But that night, after we got married, the Japanese uh, attacked Fort Stevens. Did you know that? They, Wait, what year was this? Uh, Nineteen. Let's see. We got married. Let's see, 1942. And so I didn't, he didn't get out again for like a couple months. <laughs> that was the end of our honeymoon. honeymoon. <laughs> In fact, I slept that night with my knee, my nephew, he's about three years old. I stayed overnight with my sister and her husband and they heard all the shells going off and they went out and they could see firing and stuff. But but I just slept through it. <laughs> but anyway, that was that was kind of interesting. How did you communicate with your husband once he was Fort was, Stevens? Mm -hmm. Did you have well, phone could, calls or letters? Probably not phone calls, letters, and and uh, I'd go down to the fort every time I had a chance. I'd go to Seaside stay overnight. That's why I like Seaside so much. In fact, I moved there and lived there for two years. Oh, wow. 
and worked at any job I could find. I even learned how to cut meat. <laughs> I helped. I had a butcher helper and ended up in the bank. And and uh, you can't believe what it was like working at a bank then. I didn't have any training. The men were all just being taken, so they'd put people in there. On Saturday, they would. Those shops down there were so busy during the war. They'd be lined up way out on the sidewalk to get. And you had to count every bit of coin by hand, and uh, you had a paper for debit and another paper for credit. And at the end of the day, if you made a mistake, the bookkeeper went home and she couldn't care less. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it was a miserable job, but I stuck with for a long time till Eric, Eric got shipped out, so I left. I went back and back to key punching. <laughs> <laughs> but I worked in um, oh washing dishes. Oh, one time I was a hat check girl. I was supposed to get five dollars for the night, and I went and I was doing fine until at the end of the dance hall. The dance in the dance hall. At the end of the dance. One of the sailors couldn't find his, I couldn't find his hat, you know, couldn't be outside without a cap. Couldn't find his cap, and somebody had left a bottle, and I don't know what happened to the bottle, so <laughs> there was a lot of swearing, and <laughs> but anyway, oh, life was interesting, and everybody would come down and stay with me. I found a, finally found a little tiny house in Seaside, and Family would come and stay with me, and, and friends, and so it was, I didn't suffer. <laughs> and you, you said your husband was shipped off. Um, he finally, he, he stayed there to, during the whole war. Okay. Every time he was talking about leaving, I would talk him out of it. <laughs> 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 and uh, so he um, finally got shipped out and went to Germany. And by that time the war had ended in Germany, mm -hmm. so he was did prisoner of war, worked as a guard in prisoner of war camps. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then he came home at 19, oh let's see, what would it be, 40, 45 the war was over. Mm -hmm. I was working, I moved to Portland, my parents, the house burned, my parents' house burned the year we were married, and he came home on a pass, and I was working on Saturday morning, I was getting ready to go to work, and I heard a big crash, and I looked upstairs in the hole upstairs, a fire, so all I could think about was him up there, and my yelled at my parents and ran upstairs and and he was just coming out of the bedroom and uh, I think I took hold, took a hold of his hand and he went first so he got burned on the nose and his hand was badly burned and then we just kind of plunged down the stairs. So anyway, my parents lost their house so they moved to Portland and it was the best thing that happened to them because my dad worked in the shipyards, and my mother worked at P. P. Uh, John's ship uh, furniture plant, and uh, they made money. They were able to pay off their mortgage, and after the war, they went back and started really enjoying life. So he built a new house, and uh, so it worked out for them. But I lost all my pictures and memorabilia from college and high school and all that kind of stuff. Anyway. And then another exciting thing is that when I went to, my husband was shipped to Texas and I rode the bus. I, he didn't want, he told me not to come, but I said, I'm, I, I'm coming anyway. So I went, <laughs> got on the bus, and we, the bus broke down on the Columbia, 
highway and uh, I noticed that there there were these two black fellows that were sort of arguing with each other and uh, we got back on the bus it broke down and they set on a new one I think and we got back on and when we came got close to Arlington I, I'd fallen asleep and heard all this screaming and I was on the there was a couple in front and then I was sitting by a, a nice army fellow from Salem that my husband knew and uh, heard that screaming and I looked around and this black man was coming down the aisle with a razor in his hand and so this fellow next to me pulled me back because I all I could think about was fire you know because it had been just recently the, the fire had happened and I was going to get up but he pulled me back and this fellow walked down to the front he said I won't hurt any of you white people St just stay where you are and we were just paralyzed and I looked around, the man behind me had his throat cut. And he's bleeding all over the back of my seat. So that was pretty upsetting. But we had an inquest we had to stay for. And then afterwards, all night, this person from the, <laughs> from the bus company, I guess, was sitting there typing, interviewing people. <laughs> but anyway. So those are some of the things that have happened in my life. <laughs> been rather terrifying at the time. It took took me a while to get over a fear of black people because uh, we didn't live where there were any, and just having that happen on the bus. But by the time I got to Texas, I felt so such sympathy for them was horrified the way they were treated. They let the bus went by and left Texas, you know, all that desert. They just walked, there wasn't any place in the back for him. So the bus just left him out there to pick him up. Mm -hmm. So anyway, a lot of empathy there. Were there any ways in which the war affected your life? Did you have to ration at all? Oh, yes. Everybody did. My mother-in-law, she was from Ireland, and uh, they were all from Ireland, and she was not going to put up with all that, so she would borrow from <laughs> everybody for butter and sugar, and, <laughs> then, and, she, and they would let her go by at the little grocery store in the end of the <laughs> war. She owed so many coupons. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that wasn't it. It wasn't bad here. It was in Europe that it was bad because I have a friend from um, England, and uh, I said to him, "He's he's as old as I am," and, and I said, "You have such good teeth." I always thought the English ruined their teeth with sugar. He said, "Well, during the war, we had no sugar." <laughs> yeah. So I thought that was, and after the war, for years they were a ration over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my my friend from Scotland said that Sunday night they would have a choice of mushy peas or uh, chips, maybe. That was their dinner. Wow. Uh -oh. So it took a long time for Europe to, yeah. Mm. They were eating out of garbage cans in Germany. It was horrible there. Mm. But we did wonders for the Europe. Actually, our country did. I'm glad. How long did your father stay in the shipbuilding industry? That was he stayed till the war was over. Okay. And everything closed down then. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um. I don't know whether there were. Sh I worked at the, you know, briefly at the shipyards too. Uh, but I came in uh, after Eric left overseas for overseas. I lived with my parents in Portland and got a job at the shipyards, and that was interesting because 
I was in the pipe shop typing. But then all the you know lucrative jobs were gone. It was just doing that kind of. And uh, anyway, I hadn't been there very long, and so they made me go work for this engineer who was over all the pipe shop. It was just huge. And there were people there banging and crashing and banging. And he had his office up here. And uh, he would give me a dictated a letter for me to type up. And it was seven copies on a manual typewriter. And what would you do if you made a mistake? <laughs> And I, it was so noisy, and he would always talk in a low voice, and then I would say, pardon me, and he'd just shout. <laughs> and I got this letter all typed up, and I'd go deliver it to different departments, you know, for the ships. And it was supposed to be boiler, and I'd t type blower. <laughs> I still remember that. To type that whole thing over again. <laughs> I don't. I don't think there was even white out then. <laughs> oh, so I was glad to leave that job. <laughs> did you have any other jobs during the war that you did? It sounds like you've already had quite a few. <laughs> well, I, I clerked at Safeway during the summer months in Seaside. I I, I worked at the. Um, before I went to Linfield, uh, one summer, my mother and sister pitted cherries for maraschino cherries. Mm -hmm. They are bleached. Mm -hmm. This hideous stuff they're bleached in. And um, they would, you'd pit them all. Mm -hmm. And um, the women that worked there all the time had this horrible cough. Mm -hmm. You'd hear them and you knew they worked there. But we just worked there shortly, so we, so we did that. Worked in the cannery a little bit, and uh, mainly picked fruit, you know, cherries, prunes, strawberries. We hoed strawberries. You know, it's a big job. Mm -hmm. I think a fruit farm is one of the hardest ways to make a living. I, I really do. Because if it rained, mm -hmm. the cherries would crack, and the cannery would um, grade them so low, and uh, strawberries would get, if it rained, they'd get moldy. Um, prunes could get moldy, you know. It was, it was quite a um, struggle. My friend who has Peaches agrees with me. Her brother-in-law has a wheat farm, and he just gets in his, uh, what's the word I want? Well, he just rides in comfort in his tractor, you know? <laughs> his air conditioned, it's, you know, whatever. And it's such a different life than fruit. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend it. And your family never went back to doing fruit? My okay. parents did. Oh, they did after the war. Yeah. Okay. He pulled out all the cher the prune trees though, okay. and tore down the dryer. People weren't interested in dried fruit then. Mm -hmm. It came along later, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I don't even know whether they've sold all those prunes they dried. I don't remember a <laughs> delivery truck coming and taking them. I just don't <laughs> remember it. But. Um, it, right after World War One, see, Hoover had been over there in Europe helping them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. get back uh, and to normal. And I think they used so much f dried fruit then. Mm -hmm. So everybody thought that was going to be great to keep, get into the business. But then, how much? How many prunes? Dried prunes do people? We used to dry them so dry. Not like they are today. They'd have to be soaked and to cook. Anyway, yeah. So once the war was over and your husband had returned, what did you go on to do? 
Well, it was I started having babies <laughs> <laughs> and uh, had two. He was went back as a GI. He had gone two years to Willamette, so he went back to Willamette, and uh, so that was kind of a struggle because we had two two babies and. Uh, Oh, I mean, it was just, to me, I loved being a home mother, I, a homemaker. I loved being at home with my children. And every, so many women did then, mm -hmm. like my granddaughter who's just had a baby. You know, if she stayed home, she'd be so lonely. So she, you know, she's keeping on working for one thing and they need the money, but, but, um, in those days, there were so many women who were staying at home that you always had friends, you know, mm -hmm. to do things with. It. Yeah, I was very happy to do it. I went back to key punching later, what took, took more classes. I think it's interesting, I keep telling people who are in computers and everything, I said, we were the start. The key punch it were the start. They were just so primitive. You you typed in the name and then you put we had a separate one that was numerical. You put in the amount they earned. And you the day then they had a a sorter and a tabulator. And so they could put all those cards in and the tabulator would sort, I mean a sorter would sort them, then they could tabulate and see how much money they'd got. And so then by the time I went back to key punching on my, oh I don't know, it was in my 50s maybe, I don't remember, 40s, um, it changed a lot and then it just kept changing and changing and the computers got smaller and smaller. And they were great big things at first that so we would have to make uh, I can't remember what they were called. We'd put in what they, the, and I don't remember now. It got more complicated. So, like I say, I think we were the first to start of it all because that's when the Social Security started. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of proud of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did um, you stayed in Portland then after the war? No, after Eric graduated, they were looking for somebody who could at Bay City, Oregon. You know where that is? It's up from Tillamook, mm. between Tillamook and Garibaldi. They were looking for somebody who could teach band, direct the choir, teach f social studies, PE and what's the other one, hygiene or whatever it is, and beginning band. So they said if they could find a teacher like that, they'd be pulling a rabbit out of a hat. So they <laughs> called him the rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> but we lived there for two years, and I enjoyed it a lot. But then uh, his friend, they, they would, teachers then used to go to NEA, meetings, they had big meetings in Portland, they'd go and find out from their friends where the jobs were. I don't know whether they still do that or not. I don't think so. But I don't think so. Yeah. And that way they would get to find out. And uh, so we went to Jefferson, stayed there a while, and bought a great big old house. And then we went to Staten and were there for a while. We went to Cloverdale, we were there for a while. Went to Camas and we were there, and then we came to Beaverton and he stayed here. Mm -hmm. So, so he stayed till he retired. Mm -hmm. And we were married 70 years. Wow. Yeah. During that time, did you keep in touch with anyone from oh, yeah. the field? Oh, yeah. My friends there that I lived with, we got, like I said, we got together on our 50th and had a reunion at Linfield mm -hmm. and then we would get together like in the summer and and uh, see each other and have a good time. 
They're, but I think they're all gone. I don't know about Ruth McMaster's. I've lost touch with her and Alice uh, Beeler. Uh, I uh, talked to her, but she wasn't able to come to the reunion. And uh, anyway, they're all gone that I know of. The last man standing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, is there anything else you'd like to tell us today? Any other stories you'd like to share? Well, I loved singing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the night, I, uh, uh, I mean, I had our, the professor would send me out to sing at different places. I sang all the way through high school, uh, sang in Pirates of Penzance, I had a lead and, and sang in Iolanthe and Eric and I both sang in choir at the First Presbyterian Church. It was a big choir. And in fact, um, the prof from Linfield would come and direct the choir for a while. She did that for quite a while. It was great. I loved singing. If I'd had it, had it really had a chance to do it, I would have love to have gone on to singing in some kind of a group, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, always sang in choir. Mm -hmm. What kind of people sang in choir with you at Linfield? I wasn't in choir. Oh, you weren't in choir. I didn't make it. Oh, that's right. But you, I thought you sang there. Yeah. Okay. My friend uh, Helene and Marge both made it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they played the piano. Mm. You know, if you've got something extra going for you, it helps. And mm -hmm. Helene took organ lessons too. She she really was. A, Hel my friend Helene was so brilliant. She, she and her husband uh, sold real estate, and he, I worked there at the office for a while doing something. And she could talk to somebody on the phone. She could work on a an offer from somebody, and at the same time she had something else going on. I mean, she was <laughs> she was a brilliant woman. Anyway, I can't think of much more. Would you mind telling us again about the May Day for your oh, year? Oh yes, it was perfect <laughs> weather. It was, and uh, it was just so much fun. fun. I think they, didn't they have a, a maypole then too? I believe. I think so. This yeah. This is I, the May Day that you were, you were Yes. Member. I think you ought to have some kind of a thing pointing out that the grainings are from there. <laughs> <laughs> His uh, professor graining taught, what was it, geology I believe? Um, not Matt, Homer's, Homer's father taught there. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> There's a couple even in a horse and buggy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it was a lot of fun. Oh yes, there was a maypole. <laughs> what did you like about May Day? We got rid of our ribbons, <laughs> and it was such a beautiful day. Who wouldn't love it? Yeah, you know. Of course. I didn't join a sorority. I was rushed, but I didn't because I didn't have five dollars. Mm -hmm. Cost five dollars to join. I don't know whether they charge what they charge now. A lot. A lot. <laughs> A few hundred dollars. <laughs> oh, wow. And besides, I just decided I wanted to be friends with everybody. Yeah. You know, after going to, being in all, uh, being with all the cliques in Salem High, I just didn't want to get into another clique, actually. Mm -hmm. And all the, there was no drinking. I don't think anybody smoked. Nobody could afford it. <laughs> there was no drinking on campus. 
I went to a, a frat party with the frat fellow I was dating a little bit, and uh, I don't even know what we did. When they drinking, maybe we did dance. I think probably they had, they had to go up campus because the school was so Baptist still then. Mm -hmm. Do you have to go to chapel? No. No. <laughs> I think it's kind of sad, but then you have so many different students for, with different religions, probably. Mm -hmm. That makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we had, interestingly, we had quite a few Chinese from China mm. who had come, uh, probably upper class, so they could get away from whatever was going on then, and uh, and also, uh, uh, what was his name, Jernstead, what was his name, the one that became a senator, uh, Rex, his brother, was the one I dated for a while. Um, anyway, he flew with the, the um, Flying Tigers over in China for a while, mm. and that was quite a thing there. You know, you talk about our outlook on war. That was what was exciting then, was that we had somebody from Linfield who was with the Flying Tigers. That was something, I remember that. Mm. Well, does anybody have any other questions? Any other questions? That probably does it. Well, we, we do have one final question that we like to ask every interviewee. Um, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when we say to you, Linfield College? Wonderful. Yeah. I'd love to go again. <laughs> <laughs> and I made some goodies if you'd like some. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with us and yeah. sharing. Oh, you're welcome. You have all of these adventures, both good and obviously oh, not yes, so good. I, got, I, I wrote a book of the first 23 years of my life, but I don't have one to give you. I've given them all away. When, when did you publish that? Uh, my granddaughter is graduated with a degree, master's in writing, so mm -hmm. she helped me. And, I mean, I wrote it, but... The problem was that I'm not up to new, new things. <laughs> My daughter loaned me her tablet, and instead of correcting things, I would rewrite it. Mm. So my granddaughter had to go through there and sort of piece it all together. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. So did you publish the book? No, I just for just oh. friends. Oh, okay. anybody I feel like giving it to, you know, yeah. somebody I know real well. That's really, wonderful. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm working on one for my children now. Oh. Why the first 23 years? Well, because then after that, I started having our we started having our family and being together all the time, and life got quite different, you mm -hmm. know. But the first, I had lots of things happen besides my sister being killed. We were all in the car and I didn't know until just recently that my, I was right next to my sister that was killed. Mm -hmm. I thought I was up in front with my mother, but my older sister told me I was right by my sister. We were, and uh, we had one of those big old touring cars, if you've seen those. And uh, I don't know what, how she died because um, there was no mark on her, but my niece, who's a nurse, said probably her neck was broken. Mm -hmm. You know, the impact was tremendous. She kept following us. It was after the 4th, about two days after the 4th of July, this man kept coming closer and closer. My dad tried to pull over and get away from it because it just was bearing down on us. But there was a big embankment in it embankment and he couldn't get over any farther and he crashed just wiped out along the side and so uh, I'm probably very fortunate that you know I'm still here mm. but anyway 
Thank you so much. Mary. You're welcome. Yeah. Wonderful. I just love to talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> tell that I'm story. alone. Yeah. <laughs> you tell wonderful stories. Very much so. Yeah. You have I've, a better memory than I do. <laughs> I have a darling little great granddaughter now that, oh, and I'm trying to f uh, child proof. <laughs> <laughs> How old is she? She just, she'll be a year old next month. Oh, you know, they're precious. when touch everything, handle everything, so I'm trying to <laughs> <laughs> get everything safe for her. Yeah. Does most of your family live in the area? My uh, old, the oldest in the family. Well, thank you again. You're welcome. It's so kind of you to share yeah. your stories and let us all invade your home like this. <laughs> well, I made some goodies if you want them. Oh, thank you. Oh, They're cream so cheese sweet. tarts. Would you oh, like one? Oh, my goodness. Of like some coffee and a <laughs> cup of tea. <laughs>